and welcome back to the Private Cloud Jumpstart. We're with creating and managing a private cloud with System Center 2012. I'm Simon Perriman, and I'm joined here today with the next module talking about service delivery and automation with Sean. Sean, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, Simon. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Sean Christensen. I'm a senior product marketing manager within the System Center uh, team here at Microsoft, focusing on uh, service delivery and automation within the System Center 2012. Uh, stack specifically with regards to private cloud. And you have a lot of IT background as well, right? Well, uh, yeah, I guess I could say that. My, my first job was sitting on a help desk right out of college, answering phones, listening to irate customers, feeling the pain that IT pros feel day in, day out. Um, and over the past 16 or so years, I've spent uh, my time working in that IT service management industry, either building systems, running them, consulting on them, or now helping to, to sell them. Excellent, thanks. Well, let's take a look at where we are on the agenda for this Jumpstart. So this morning we covered the introduction of what is the private cloud, what is System Center 2012. We then had Ken and join us to discuss the private cloud infrastructure, so the physical hardware, and then how we can optimize that for the private cloud. And we're now joined by Sean, who's going to talk about kind of this middle integration layer, really the IT pros help desk, where they could go and take requests from customers, and then go automate process, allocate hardware, and deliver those applications or those services to the end user. That's, that's right, Simon. Uh, service delivery and automation is really taking the technology and applying the people and process uh, aspects of it to the overall private cloud equation, uh, leveraging System Center, leveraging Windows Server, and specifically what we're going to be focusing on is uh, the service manager and the orchestrator components of System Center 2012. Great, so let's take a look at the detailed agenda. Yeah, so what I'm going to spend time focusing on uh, in this session is three areas around service delivery and automation. How we approach standardization, uh, and specifically looking at uh, how we organize and deliver uh, service offerings, request offerings uh, through our service catalog, uh, the process automation, and even systems automation behind that. Um, how we approach self-service from a service delivery and automation standpoint. Uh, and then also, I already mentioned it, but the systems automation pieces of uh, System Center 2012 and uh, specifically Orchestrator to go and uh, allow us to automate these types of uh, requests and activities within the private cloud to really drive um, a consistent experience, uh, a standard experience, but a, an experience for customers at scale. So I, I've heard standardization used a lot when we're talking about, you know, just private cloud in general. Why is standardization so important with the service delivery and automation step? Well, we talk about standardization from the perspective of a service uh, consumer, somebody who's coming to IT saying, I need something. You want to ensure that they're going to get the same experience each time, every time uh, they come to IT. I mean, historically, what did we see happen? Someone called up, they spoke to somebody, if they got lucky, and they got one experience on one occasion, what happens when they call up a second time? Quite often, maybe a different person, different expectations, different level of experience. Standardization and our approach to standardization allows us to make sure that regardless if you call up once, twice, three times, you're going to get the same experience. Um, or you go to our service catalog and request services for within private cloud, you're going to get the same experience, you're going to get the same level of service, and you're going to get a consistent experience. And over time, oh, sorry, uh, but over time, you know, as we kind of standardize this and we know, hey, this is the key requirements or the key infrastructure pieces, hardware storage network for a particular service, yep. we can then automate that. We've done it once. We know how it's supposed to look like. The next step is really automating it, streamlining it, making it more efficient. Exactly. We can capture some of the, we can capture those best practices and ensure that they are executed every time. Excellent. So, Getting into this concept of service delivery and automation, you've, the slide up here has been a shared number of cases in the sessions that we've had already. The only thing I'm going to say about this is when I think about service delivery and automation, we span the whole gamut. We think about productive infrastructure, predictable applications, and really driving for customers their cloud. It's about delivering consistent service, delivering standardized service across all of these areas. Um, when we think about delivering IT as a service, um, we have our self-service capabilities, our service model. Service delivery and automation sits right between that self-service experience for the application uh, owner and the data center admin of the service provider that is delivering uh, on that infrastructure back to the end user. So right there in the middle, service delivery and automation, 
and the components of orchestrator and service manager, these are the ones that really play into this part around service delivery and automation and where we're going to spend most of our time today on. So I want to step back a little bit further. The service delivery and automation, apart from the application owner and the data center or the service provider or the data center admin, we have these two roles of the service consumer and the service provider. And this is an interrelationship that happens between these two personas or these two roles on an ongoing basis. And standardization plays a key part, pr primarily for the service provider in being able to identify what are the services what are the, uh, that they are going to deliver from IT to their consumers, to their uh, application owners. How they deliver those in a self-service manner, so those uh, service consumers, those application owners can, can access the, the types of services, the, the level of service they want, when they want, and then all of the automation that goes into delivering on those services, uh, whether it be provisioning or we get into my next session talk a little bit more about the ongoing uh, monitoring and automation aspects within the private cloud. And this, this interrelationship between standardization, between automation, between self-service really uh, encompasses both the processes that are uh, made up of uh, each of these areas as well as the systems that are used to deliver, technically, physically actually deliver the services. So we, uh, things that Kenan was talking about uh, in his sessions around I mean, actually delivering the, the service templates, provisioning those. We could actually automate all of those and it becomes the choice of the, uh, the service provider to determine how much automation do they want to introduce based on what their business is going to want to achieve. So service delivery and automation, we talked about self-service, talked about standardization, we talked about automation. How this comes to the forefront, how this comes about is uh, through a number of areas. With self-service, we get into having uh, people have access to our service catalog, uh, which is we have reintroduced a new service catalog as part of System Center 2012 uh, that has uh, really rewritten our original portal for within Service Manager from the ground up. So, so, so what, what is this uh, service catalog, though? Like, what exactly is this? Is this a web interface people could go to and actually pick a particular service that they want deployed that's offered by the IT department? So that's exactly, that's exactly it. It is, picture, um, let me see, you go to restaurants. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the first thing the person does when you walk into a restaurant? They, after they seat you at your table, what do you get? Usually get a menu. You get a menu. Maybe a glass of water on the side. Okay, well, okay, <laughs> glass of water aside, because we already have that, but you get your menu. Your menu are the... Here's what the restaurant offers you, and you can pick from that menu. You can ask for variations if you wish, but that is a, for lack of a better, that is a service catalog. Here are the offerings. Here's the services that the restaurant is going to offer you. In the same way, a service catalog is a menu of services of, that IT is offering to its business to be able to, um, that consumers can pick and choose. And it's fully customizable, right? It's not like there's only 10 that they have to choose from. The IT ah, department, yeah. they can build them, customize them. Absolutely. Right? The IT department can build, customize them. I'm going to get into a demo. I'm actually going to show how we actually do this. Um, and the neat thing is everything we're doing, we don't, to build the service catalog requires no coding. Excellent. Uh, and Very nice. It's a much more powerful, much more flexible compared to what we had uh, previously. So great for the IT pro that's afraid of the code, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, as part of that, getting back to this, when we talk about standardization, so we talked about the service catalog and giving people that choice. Part of that is delivering standard services, and how we do that is really through our configuration management database, or CMDB, is the buzzword that we hear in, in the industry. We have one. Uh, it is part of System Center 2012. It was part of System Center 2010. Um, it delivers a consistent view, a central point of reference for all I, for IT components that are uh, within an organization. Uh, that system center touches and can access uh, and reconciles it together uh, into one single point. We can use that in delivering out services to the to the consumer. Now is CMDB uh, unique only to service manager or can this database be used by other different system center components to get data and information? It's a good question. The CMDB is, u is, is used by or is um, accessed from for all other system center components. So for example, configuration manager, uh, we write data from configuration manager into the service manager CMDB. We write data from virtual machine manager, 
from orchestrator, from operations manager, even from Active Directory nice. uh, into the service manager CMDB. Uh, using orchestrator, we can actually access data outside of System Center and write that data into the CMDB. So we really get a full view of what's in our organization's infrastructure. Now, do those other systems use the service manager CMDB? Uh, not by default. They have their own databases. The CMDB is a reads into its database from those other systems. So the service manager reads the C configuration manager database into its CMDB and reconciles it with data from operations manager from elsewhere. And we have a series of connectors, and I'll show how that looks uh, as well. Great. The lastly is the automation. Automation is, allows us to deliver that consistent experience, but deliver it at scale. So we don't have, for the IT pro, it means being able to uh, deliver those services, but not always have to sit around and wait for someone to call up saying, hey, can you do this for me? And then they go off and do it. Now, that, I've had question, conversations with some IT pros, and they say, well, you're doing me out of a job here. No, we're not. We're making it possible for you to automate the, the, what I call the low-value tasks, those, mm -hmm. those simple things that, I mean, yeah, you could spend days on end doing that really add, all they do is just shift boxes or install products. Get those automated. One, they, they happen consistently. Two, they happen without you thinking about it. Um, and three, it allows the IT pro to start thinking, hey, what, is, what are those other things on my to-do list? What are those other things that can really add value to the business that I can, can I start delivering? So there's a six-step process that I want to walk us through here. Um, this I call automating request offerings in, in six steps. And the rest, of this set, the rest of this presentation is really going to be talking about how we approach delivering um, consistent requests, delivering ser services to the co consumer through the service catalog um, using this process. First one is about importing, uh, how we bring data together, um, both from a systems automation standpoint as well as a uh, external or data within the other data, uh, system center repositories to deliver our services, how we build those offerings and make them available to, through our service catalog, and then how users go about creating a request for service, what happens when that request is created, so what automation activities do we invoke, and then how can we monitor for those for progress, see that those uh, are fulfilled. So that's what we're going to spend most of our time walking through. Um, and this is another way of looking at a very straightforward approach terms of what are the components that really come into play here. So we have orchestrator, uh, we have service manager, and we have virtual machine manager that really play a part in delivering these on these requests. So we touched on standardization is about defining those services to be offered, uh, defining what requests we're going to make of each of those services, and who's going to be involved, publishing those out, from a self-service standpoint to the end user so they can access and choose what they want to do. Um, and then the automation that goes in behind that to help deliver upon that. So we're going to touch on standardization. Now, three areas I'm going to spend our time in talking about standardization. How we go about importing that information, so importing automation uh, runbooks from orchestrator into service manager, how we build our service and request offerings, and the automation around the process side Remember, automation is both systems as well as the processes to give an to give end-to-end -end consistent experience. So let's look at importing in data uh, and runbooks into Service Manager or into the CMDB. We start off with, our, with Service Manager. Service Manager has um, a series of what are called connectors. These connectors allow us to import data into uh, the CMDB. So from Virtual Machine Manager, we can import details about service templates, uh, virtual machine templates, storage classifications, logical networks, load balancers, uh, load balancer VIP templates. All those things that Kenan was showing you in terms of managing your infrastructure, we can get that information and we can pull it into Service Manager so we can reference it and use it. Within Operations Manager, we're capturing configuration item or CI data that we're man monitoring as part of Operations Manager. So servers, clients, hardware, websites, databases. Um, just about anything the operations manager can monitor, we can actually reference inside the CMDB inside a service manager. Configuration manager, we pull in computers, hardware, software, um, primary user information if you're using asset intelligence inside configuration manager, um, as well as uh, desired configuration management uh, non -compli or compliance data. So if a customer is using DCM as part of, sorry, desired configuration management 
as part of Configuration Manager. We can um, monitor for non-compliance within DCM and actually create an incident inside a Service Manager. But Active Directory, we get information about users, groups, and computers, printers, user manager, users. And then through Orchestrator and Orchestrator Runbooks, we can actually pull data from those third-party applications or line of business applications into our CMDB and reference that data as well. Now, I mentioned a number of overlapping items, configuration items from Ops Manager, Configuration Manager, Virtual Machine Manager, talking about computers, users, and details that quite obviously people would say, well, am I going to end up with multiple records? One from Ops Manager, one from Configuration Manager, one from Active Directory. The answer is no. We reconcile all of that information together so that you're looking at a single entry related to a computer or a server or a user inside of Service Manager that's come, we've had data come from multiple locations and brought together. Excellent. And what about third-party configuration management databases, third-party CMDBs? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to go and inject that data into the System Center 2012 CMDB? And vice versa. So yes, we can. Uh, we would use Orchestrator. In fact, we have a number of integration packs uh, with, Orchestra with the 2012 Orchestrator component of System Center 2012 that will be coming out that allow us to uh, write data to uh, other configuration management databases like, uh, uh, say, BMC's Atrium. Uh, is an example of one of those other external parties that we would be able to, to either write data to or query data from. Great. Um, now, I mentioned the integration packs, but say you don't want to use Orchestrator, which if I would say absolutely we got to use. We can import data using just CSV data imports. We can write a custom connector using the software development kit, um, or we can create an integration pack or create a, a, a script in PowerShell import data into the CNDB. There's plenty of options to get data in and get data out and make it usable. What we, once we have the data in our CNDB, we now need to do something with it. So we've gotten the data in, we apply that using templates and make that available uh, in, a in a template that allows us to really uh, pre-populate data values in our request forms. Uh, this allows us to minimize data entry. It can standardize processes, so when we're creating a new request, we know what values are going to get created, what's going to get entered uh, each time and every time. Um, it helps us ensure compliance. We're having to make sure that we're following specific processes as part of our compliance re uh, requirements. We can, we can define those in templates inside of service requests and allow us to, to ensure that we're adhering to those. And once again, you said this does not require any code, right? It's wizard-based, you enter a few fields, and then you can go and publish that, and anyone can use it. Absolutely. So, I mean, when we create a template, it's as simple as you see on the screen there, entering values into a field. Right. Uh, and, that, and saving that template, and then applying that to the, the template to the service request when it's created. Great. So there's no need to have custom code to create your own service catalog, anything like that. Simply use the wizard-based approach fill out the fields, and you could go and offer this to the rest of your organization. Absolutely. And now, one point, you don't need to. You can if you want. So there are some IT pros that say, hey, I want to add more to this. Great. Yes, it's the portal, the service catalog, and I'll show it a little bit, is Silverlight hosted in SharePoint. So you can customize it, reskin it using standard SharePoint tools, or you can leave it as is. Very nice. Choices up to, choices up to them. Power is in their hands. Once we have our templates, we then apply those uh, templates to what's called a request offering. Uh, now, a request offering is really it's a re offering created by IT, the IT service provider that um, consumers can access and complete from the service catalog. So here's where what we define what the end user sees in the service catalog. Um, so we, we use the template that we just created in terms of what are the default values we want to populate in the service request. We then define what are the questions or what are the prompts that we want to ask the end user when they are filling this out. So let's go back to our example you and I were talking about earlier uh, when we're in a restaurant. You're looking at your menu. You're looking at your service catalog. You want to pick a sandwich off the menu. You're having lunch. Uh, what are the questions that often get asked by the, the, per the person who's coming to take your order? Okay, What kind of bread do you want? What kind of meat do you want? Do you want tomatoes? Tomatoes. Do you want? <laughs> um, 
do you want a, a particular spread, mayonnaise, mustard, butter? Right. Uh, do you want salt and pepper? All these different choices. These are questions that you hopefully get asked every time you place that order. Same as with a service catalog. If you, the user prompts allow us to d identify and define what are the choices we're going to let a user make as part of filling out their request. And we capture those, define those once, and they get ac accessed each time and every time with the end user when they're filling out their request. Now, as all of this data is collected, you know, let's say we have uh, the same service request completed a thousand times by a thousand different users. All of that information is getting saved into the database. Yep. Is there any way that we can, you know, pull up that information, put it in an Excel spreadsheet so that we can see, hey, 80% of our customers like cheese? Yes. Great. So you're, you're stealing my thunder in terms of next session. Ah, okay. When we get into some of the reporting capabilities that we're bringing out with Service Manager 2012. And the, yeah, I'll, I'll save that till then. I'll be stealing a lot of thunder today. <laughs> for as well. um, so let's get back to our, our request offering. We can define our prompts. We can configure what those prompts are. So in, in addition to asking the question, you can also offer choice. So you can, uh, to the end user, to select. And you can query for that information and pull that information from the CMDB. Now, got a couple more slides, but then I want to get into actually showing what this physically lo looks like. Once we define those questions, we define, configure those prompts, we then map the, the responses to fields in our service request form and into our orchestrator runbook so that what the end user fills out gets passed automatically to the process and the system's automation activities to fulfill that request. And in some cases, the only person that literally touched it was the end user. So the service provider, the IT pro, you define it once. Uh, set it all up, publish it, the end user then selects it, and as you were saying, if you get a thousand people entering it, great, you're capturing it a thousand times. You don't have to have a thousand people sitting back there waiting to actually do it. It just rolls through and starts happening and runs through at scale. And that's what that automation is about, capturing and helping us drive things like how, it's, I mean, how we classify it, how we route it, who needs to approve it, what run books do we need to invoke to be able to ensure that the, uh, the request is fulfilled. So we touched on importing, building, and publishing our request offering and getting it out there for the user. Now I want to spend some, let's get out of slides. Let's actually flick over to a demo, and I want to show what, uh, show what this actually looks like okay, uh, in Service Manager 2012 and, and Orchestrator. So uh, we're going to be seeing Service Manager 2012, Orchestrator 2012. So those are the components that we're going to get here. Right? Absolutely. Let's see. We got. Here we go. And so which are we looking at now? So I'm going to start with the end in mind. And okay. so what I'm showing you right now is the uh, service catalog inside that's available now with system, uh, Service Manager 2012. Um, this is a Silverlight Web Parts hosted in SharePoint. Now, I'm running here SharePoint Foundation. You can use SharePoint Foundation. You can use SharePoint Enterprise. Um, big difference. SharePoint Foundation is free. Enterprise costs you something. But you can use either one for publishing your service catalog. Here we have a couple of uh, different service offerings. We can see we have some cloud services, enterprise application services, or if I scroll down a little bit, just some general uh, requests around employee services. This is a service catalog that allows you to publish whatever IT wants to publish to the end user. For private cloud, we have our private cloud services under here. I'll go ahead and click on that service offering. And it's going to bring up and deliver for us a particular request. So I'm going to request a particular virtual machine. Go ahead and pop that up. And it's going to go and go to our particular request form. And here's where we are prompted for our information. Now, Ken in his session talked about the different virtual machine and service templates that uh, are available. Here's where we can actually select what are those templates that we want to grab and use and deliver for our, in our virtual machine that we want to have created. So I'll go ahead and select a particular one. I'm going to scroll down here and give it a name. So we'll say, call it Jumpstart01 Business Justification because Simon really wants to see this. I really do. Yeah. Now, I noticed here I've had a couple of different field types. I have a selection list mm -hmm. and a couple of free text options. I'll go ahead and click Next. Um, and I can review the entries I've created. 
I'll go ahead and submit. And so what's happening now? So you've clicked so, submit from a web-based, a web form. Web form. What, what is created is what I've... What happens now? Well, let's go take a look and see what that looks like. So here I have SR97162. That's my service request. So what has happened is I've filled out my form, and I've created a service request inside of Service Manager that is automatically created, automatically populated with the data that I entered, um, and is kicking off a process workflow to go ahead and fulfill this particular request. So let's go ahead and take a look at how what actually ended up happening there. Now, I actually had a question that uh, came in first that I think is a good time to ask. Um, can you speak a little more about you know what exactly is a runbook, what exactly is a workflow? Certainly, a runbook is a uh, a series is an orchestrator term that is a series of um, activities, standardized activities that you link together to fulfill a particular task. So let's say we have to, or Kenan showed the example of creating a new, uh, deploying a new service or creating a new virtual machine. Mm -hmm. um, and he walked through a series of steps that he needed to, uh, to do to f actually fulfill that task. Uh, with Orchestrator, we can actually automate that. And in fact, this example, we do automate the, the creation of that virtual machine using a series of standardized activities uh, within Orchestrator that fulfills that particular request. I'm actually going to show what that physically looks like. Here we have, on our demo screen, we have the actual re request that was just created. And we have the linkage of both our process automation and systems automation uh, here within this particular service request. So I'm going to go ahead and open my particular service request, click on activities, and I have two default, acti uh, two default activities listed here. One is a manual activity or a review activity, so someone needs to approve this request. And the second one is an, a orchestrator automation activity that actually fulfills and goes and kicks off this runbook and fulfills that. So let's, I want to pause there. I actually want to show how this was put together. Uh, and then we can go ahead and continue, continue this on and see how the, work, the workflow ends. First thing I want to show is how was that runbook actually created. So here I've, I've moved over into Orchestrator. This is my Orchestrator runbook uh, designer, where I have a series of, I actually have a number of tasks that I've created here that allows me to actually create a virtual machine. So I have a, a, a couple of different uh, folders in here showing my different uh, particular activities. In this one, I specifically have create virtual machine. I'm initializing data, so I'm defining what my values are. I'll go ahead and open that up and let you see. So here I've defined a virtual machine name and uh, activity good, which is, is a unique identifier. I capture my particular properties. So I'm grabbing the, my particular unique identifier from my service request. I'm getting the virtual machine template details about that, that I selected in my form. So I select the virtual machine template. This activity is going and getting that details. And then I have my last activity, which is now tel telling virtual machine manager, go now create this virtual machine using this template, using these, this information, and tell me when you're done. That, that's great. Now, I see that there's a lot on the screen here. Could you give us just a quick overview of how you're exactly navigating this, what's on the left, how you're managing the central pane, and then all these integration components on the right? Absolutely. So once my mouse comes back here, it's, oh, that's nice, isn't that? Um, let me come back to that while that is deciding it wants to wake up on me. Oh, wait, there we go. Now, of course, this is the release candidate. This is release candidate, so something decided to give it a little hiccup. So what I have here on my screen, on the left-hand side, I have my connections to the various uh, orchestrator servers uh, that I want to connect to. So my, in my Runbook Designer, I can connect to one or more or multiple servers. And you can have multiple orchestrator servers in an environment. If, if you choose, yes, you can do that. Let me go ahead and close out of that. On the right-hand side, I have my activities uh, pane. This is, contains uh, the different integration packs and activities that I want, can use in creating a runbook. So I have uh, out-of-the-box uh, integration packs and activities for I mean, doing things like uh, manipulating files, manipulating directories, writing to event logs, monitoring uh, directories and files and event logs, um, sending emails. 
I also have additional integration packs uh, that will ship with, with System Center 2012 for all the other System Center products. So integration pack for Virtual Machine Manager, Service Manager, Configuration Manager, Operations Manager, Data Protection Manager. That will allow me to create runbooks to interact with all of those different components. I also have integration packs for external third-party line of business applications like VMware, BMC, HP, uh, IBM uh, are some examples of some of those integration packs that we're creating. And can you create a custom one, for example? Absolutely. We have uh, the Orchestrator uh, uh, integration toolkit uh, that is downloadable off of TechNet that you can access. You can actually build your own integration pack uh, using, the, using the integration toolkit um, and publish that and make it available and, and create runbooks using it. So, so in theory, you can automate pretty much anything that you can script? Yeah, and in fact, if you have a PowerShell script, we have a default activity to run PowerShell script Excellent. or run .NET script, so you don't even need to create the integration. You can actually just call the PowerShell script from even within better. a default activity. So yes, it's, it, it's really neat because it, you can automate anything that you can script, or even if you have a script, you can call that using Orchestrator within a runbook. Well, I mean, I think this is one of the key components of the Microsoft Private Cloud, right? We talk about cross-platform for the metal up. We can support anything. Absolutely. We can manage anything. And this includes customizing. Even if you have a, your own line of business application, unique to your company, you can still integrate it within your private cloud and have automation interacting with the different components. Absolutely. So we build our runbook here. Once we have that runbook available uh, and, and working, we then import that into Service Manager. And we, that happens using the connector that we have in place within Service Manager. So I go back to my Service Manager console and go over to my Administrations tab, and I select my Connectors folder. This, the Connectors folder allows us to uh, configure the different connectors that link out to the different components within Service Ma System Center uh, and pull data in. And here I have my uh, Orchestrator connector. I'll go ahead and open that up and show you what we actually how we actually configure this. Each of these connectors is very easy to configure, to pull data into Service Manager, store inside the CMDB, and use for building, um, building process, building uh, workflows, building our service offerings and request offerings. So I have my connection details, what orchestrator server I'm connecting to, what synchronization folder. All that means is what folder in orchestrator, if I go back over to orchestrator, if I look on my OIS server under my runbooks, what folder underneath runbooks do I want to grab? And it's going to grab that folder and everything else underneath that. So in my connector, I've simply said, give me the root folder. So it's going to grab all the runbooks that I have inside of Orchestrator and pull those across. Um, and then I also have a linkage to the Orchestrator web console, so I can actually reference uh, a runbook and see where the runbook is in its, in its execution from within an actual service request. So go back to, to our example. Uh, you're in your restaurant, you've placed your order, you want to know where the order is up to. Inside Service Manager, when we've got a request that's in progress, end user calls up and says, hey, where, where's that new service template of mine? Where's that virtual machine in its creation? Is it done yet? Are we ready? We can actually reference that and tell a person exactly where the, it is in this, the runbook stage. Um, or in the, the process stage. So tracking, being able to understand where something is, uh, is very easy to do. So that's our orchestrator connector. Allows us to, to pull data into Service Manager and reference that. Once we have that orchestrator runbook information inside the Service Manager, we create an activity from it. And I showed what, the, what that ultimately re results in, in the actual service request, where we had our two activities. So we grabbed our review activity, that's out of the box, our orchestrator execution activity, that came from our runbook. We just connected them together in a template. Great. Now, um, i got a very interesting question here. As we look at about uh, all the different integration components, integration packs with orchestrator, mm -hmm. is there anything which extends out to the public cloud, out to Windows Azure? Can we automate any processes such as deploying a VM to an Azure subscription? So we are working, that is something that we are working on. Uh, I've got some, don't have any additional information, but that's something that has come up. We are working on pulling, pulling one of those together. So stay so, tuned. Yeah, say, great question. Stay tuned. More information is coming. 
So we have our we have our orchestrator connector. We also have our different connectors too, as I talked about earlier: virtual machine manager, operations manager, configuration manager. I'm going to go ahead and hold off on those, and let's walk through, continue walking through our example. We created our um, service request. We first built all of the uh, runbooks. We imported those into to service manager. We now need to actually create that template. That, gets, that populates our service request so we know what activities we want to, to kick off. So I'm going to go over here into my library space and select templates. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring up our, uh, my particular template that I have here. Go ahead and load that up. And remember, I said template was simply filling out fields in a form. Here's our standard service request uh, form in a template, so a different little color here, and I have my different fields, request VM, urgency, priority, uh, source. So I'll say the source came from the portal. I can automatically define who I want to assign this to, so I'll go ahead and leave that blank. Um, and then here I define what are my activities that I want to uh, specify for this template. So what this allows me to do is standardize what are the tasks, what are the activities that need to be executed, uh, both from a, either a manual activity or a review activity, so if someone needs to approve it, or a uh, runbook automation activity right within my template and predefine those. So every time someone creates a new request using this template, uh, all those same activities are automatically added. We don't have to remember, oh, gosh, I forgot to do that step. So I'll go ahead and bring up my review activity. This allows me to specify who my reviewer is. Can't close that out. And then I have my request VM activity, which is my runbook automation, which actually executes that runbook that we just showed you. And here we see in the runbook configuration, I have my virtual machine name and my uh, activity unique identifier. These are the details that we identified in our runbook. Uh, that get passed back into Service Manager. So we will now, as part of our request offering, map values to that runbook, to this template, and then hand it off. So go ahead and close that up. So we have our template. Go ahead and, actually, I'll save that, because I did make a small change. While that is saving, so we have our runbook. We imported that. We have the details from our runbook already in Service Manager. We have our template that we defined, our predefined values. And when my screen comes back here, we're going to go ahead back into our console. And I'm going to go over to my particular request offering. And here's all my listed request offerings. And I'll go ahead and pull up the specific one that we had earlier in our portal. And this is what we, where we define what are our user prompts, what gets published, and what gets published to the end user. So we had a user prompt for, um, oh, I grabbed the wrong one. Pull this up. For a user to specify what their virtual machine template is what the VM name is, and their business justification. You remember those three fields we selected. And I've specified that my virtual machine template is the result of a query, and I have two text boxes. If I want to add additional ones, I can add those right here. I can also reorder my questions. So if they want, I want them to, to take place in a specific order, I can do that too. Enter this in free text. Define what are values here. No coding, just populate values in a field. I then specify what my virtual machine template is and what its output is based on. And I can configure those and specify limits. So I want to uh, give people the option to choose what is your virtual machine template. So instead of them having to remember, oh, and an end user, who's going to know what the template is that they want to use for their virtual machine? So you pro give them the choice that they can select. Uh, and you get the same response and get the same information that you need. Again, that standardization, that consistency. Again, that standardization. Now, the data here 
comes directly from what's in Virtual Machine Manager through that connector. So the synchronization takes place automatically, so you don't have to keep them in sync or remember, hey, if I change a new, add a new template in Virtual Machine Manager, do I need to change anything here? No. It automatically happens. And so the updated values show back up inside that request offering from any changes that take place in the source, which is Virtual Machine Manager. Very nice. Um, I then have my Virtual Machine name. I can, I've defined it as a string. Bring up configure. I can specify some information about what that string should look like. So any string, do I want a specific email address, phone number? I mean, we can specify some constraints around what that information should look like. Again, making sure that's consistent. Um, and then my business justification. Once I've defined those, I map those to fields in my runbook activity and in my service request. So again, data entered by the end user, automatically mapped directly to the automation that needs to take place. So no, no, in, no handoffs in between. Excellent. Um, so I have a question that ca came in here. Um, System Service Manager, what's the compatibility or what's the compliance with ITIL? What's the compliance of, with ITIL? Service Manager is, um, supports ITIL processes. We support uh, quite a number of them from incident management, problem management, change management, uh, service request fulfillment, um, right down to some of the uh, higher order ones around asset uh, management, uh, release management, configuration management, service level management. We do some, we, uh, 2012 introduces service level agreement capabilities, so we do some support with service level management. Um, we have other Microsoft solutions and partners that add additional functionality to, to any number of those. Uh, it is, we can facilitate and have facilitated a number of the different process areas within um, areas such uh, frameworks like ITIL version 3. Um, mm -hmm. People have always asked me, well, are you comp compliant with uh, ITIL? Well, we compatible with ITIL. ITIL is a framework. You can pick and choose what you want to do. And then I get another question. Well, are you compliant with ITIL version 2 or version 3? Pick one. Um, you can use it either one. We support, we support the ITIL frameworks. And are compatible with those uh, with those frameworks. You would you would satisfy, uh, or you would be able to satisfy most of the aspects of ITIL version three processes using service using System Center 2012. Excellent. With our request offering, we might want to attach some knowledge articles to it, and then we publish it. So this one was already one that we created, so we actually published that one straight up to the service catalog. So we had our runbook. We added that to a template. We attached that template and prompts to a request offering. And then we published that under a service offering. A service offering is simply a container of multiple requests. So the same idea is you want to order, uh, you have a particular service, like our private cloud services. What are the requests you want to make of those? So it allows us to group things together. So once we have a request offering, we group that with our service offerings. So we had our private cloud services. That'll go ahead and open up. And we have the, de the detailed information, related services that it's associated with, and our request offering uh, that's associated with that this particular service, in this case, our request VM. That allows us to publish that to the service catalog, and we create, such as we just did. So we talked about the runbooks, we talked about the templates, the request offerings, and published that using the service offering. We created our actual service request. Let's actually go ahead and approve that. All right. So we have our particular request here. I'm going to go ahead and just for uh, speed sake, open that up and hit approve. Yes, go ahead. I'll apply that. Hit OK. And I'll just apply my service request here. And what we're going to see here, ooh, I'm going to ooh, uh oh. Actually, it probably just overwritten itself in the back end. Let me go ahead and bring up my service request again that we just created. We can see it's in progress. I think it might have overwritten me a little too quickly. Let me go ahead and open that up again. I'll approve it. Go 
Click OK. I'll go ahead and click OK. There we go. So what's now happening in the background? I've approved that request. Um, the approval is getting written back to the database. It's updating the activity, which is updating our service request, and is now going to go ahead and kick off that orchestrator runbook and start fulfilling and building out our, our request offering. So we should be able to we'll refresh here. Go ahead and open that up. And we see here on our, on our particular service request, that first bo activity box, which was originally a little play icon, is now changed to a check, meaning that's, act that's complete. We've now moved on to the next, acti next uh, activity, which is our request VM, which is now in progress. So I can go ahead and open that up. And this is my run book that's actually running uh, and creating that virtual machine that we selected. So I move up here. Now one thing uh, we talked about is how can I actually see what progress, where things are in progress? How is this run book actually, is this run book uh, done? Is it in progress? Where are we? I click on this link over here, move, okay, view most recent job. We can see the run book activity has not been executed, so we're simply, we're waiting for Orchestrator to kick off and actually uh, run itself. I can go ahead and open up my Orchestrator portal. Which will go ahead and log me directly into orchest my Orchestrator web console and bring up that particular run book. I can look at my jobs and I see that I actually, okay, the job is actually started now. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. I'll look at my details. And I can see, you see right here, and it's actually in progress, you can see it ticking over right away. I've initialized my data, got the details, and now I am over and creating that, creating a virtual machine from my template. So what did we, now I didn't actually kick that process off, I just created the service request and approved it. Service manager and orchestrator took care of the delivery of that option to select and create that virtual machine and the automation to actually go ahead and do it. We can see it probably, time it, air it out on me here so we can go ahead and take a look at I can bring up Orca virtual machine manager and I can see and troubleshoot that and get that back, back up and running again not sure why that actually took place but what we have happen here is our, our activity progressed and as it completes it'll update my particular service request and will update the end user saying hey your service request is now closed here's your uh, login details to your particular virtual machine. How does that end user see that? Does that go through email? Do they need to log back into a web-based portal to get that information? Uh, you can actually configure both. Great. So we configure. We can use an orchestrated runbook to kick off an email. We've also got notifications uh, set up inside a service manager as well. Um, or they can go into the actual portal, into the request offering portal, and I can see my requests and I can look at the particular request that we just created. Uh, 97162, we can see it's in progress, and I can look at the details, so I can I have a number of different ways to be able to get access to that information. You know what I really like about you know this in general? The answer to every question is yes, it can be done with Orchestrator. Yes. Isn't that great? No matter what it's, you're trying to do, send an email, go to a web page, provision a new VM, yes, it can it was, be done with Orchestrator. What, what is the process that you want to automate? is the question I often ask is, and let's talk about how we can actually sit down and automate that. Break it down into the little steps. Break it down into the steps, identify what activity is going to achieve those, link them together. Building a runbook uh, inside of Orchestrator is, is literally like dragging and dropping, or is dragging and dropping activities and linking them together, much like you would build a Visio, uh, right. Visio diagram. Excellent. So that was the demo I wanted to show you. Let me Flick over, and we talked, and I'll, I've talked about a number of different things here, and I'll flick back and, and show those. But I was going to—I want to talk next about self-service. Self-service is is that portal experience, being able to make it possible for people to have really what I call controlled empowerment. You're giving through the portal the the end users the power of choice, but you're controlling what those choices are. So you can publish our request offerings out to the end user, 
uh, and allow them to choose what they want to select. Uh, when they want to select it, they could log into the portal and select something at 2 o'clock in the morning, but you don't have to be awake to, to sit there and receive it or fulfill it. The automation is in place, but they have the ability to access what they want, when they want, at the level of service plus cost that they want. I mean, I mean that's great. You know, we've seen IT transform really with this global marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. Businesses function 24/7. Yeah. But you don't necessarily need that help guy sitting there 24/7. So yet another way that the private cloud can save with economics. Absolutely. Um, we also make it uh, role-based. We think about self-service. You don't want to offer the same uh, request offerings to every per every person inside your organization. You may want to give uh, maybe technology-based request offerings to a certain group and uh, other, a different set of application-based request offerings to a, a different group. And this allows you to, we allow you through that portal to actually set that up and define that and publish it out to the, to the user community. Uh, and the last thing, and I think you already saw that, is a simplified portal. Silverlight Web Parts hosted in SharePoint. You can skin it, you can read, you can tailor it to fit within your company's intranet or extranet, however you choose. Um, and it's using out-of-the-box functionality uh, that we make available. Um, control empowerment, it was really provider published, user initiated. We make, we make those request offerings available. Users can select those when they want. They can, it allows us to express IT requests um, in easier in business language. So we can make it consistent so that the prompts are the same each time and every time. And as I mentioned, users can select what level of service and cost that they want whenever they want to do it. Um, we talked about what those service offerings were uh, and how those are, allow us to encapsulate one or more request offerings that we then publish up. Um, we make it role-based so you can have different types of uh, offerings presented to different types of users. Uh, and that's simply I mean, creating a new, uh, what we call a catalog group, defining the, uh, the role, the uh, end user role, that we want to attach that catalog group to, and then giving those uh, that role access to those particular offerings. And then the simplified portal. Um, I, it may seem like I'm harping on this, but if you, uh, if you worked with the, the portal that we published with 2010, and you've worked with this one, you know this one is just so much, uh, so much better. Um, dare I say it, so much sexier. <laughs> Um, one of the things we've also had uh, customers ask us about is, uh, what are you, are you providing any best practices? Um, I've got, great, the new portal looks great, um, service manager looks great, orchestrator looks great, bringing those two together looks fantastic, but can you make it easier for me? Um, what do you think my answer is going to be? Probably. Yes. <laughs> um, we do this and we prov are providing something called the Cloud Services Process Pack. And this is a collection of out-of-the-box best practices that are meant to um, uh, support the, uh, the implementation of uh, what was the uh, self-service portal that was part of VMM, uh, the previous release of Virtual Machine Manager. Uh, so we provide out-of-the-box uh, extensions uh, and uh, additional fields into the Service Manager schema to support this. We provide uh, default service request templates. So those templates I showed, we actually pre-create some and populate those. We pre-create and populate request offerings that you can take, copy, and tailor to your to our customers' businesses. Uh, and we provide out-of-the-box runbooks. So we've already built a number of runbooks to actually do the provisioning for our end users. So we allow them to get up to speed, take service manager, take orchestrator, take virtual machine manager, take the system center 2012 suite, and actually you leverage the cloud services process pack and actually start building infrastructure uh, capabilities quickly and easily. That sounds great, but uh, speaking about VMM a little more, we have a great question here. Let's say that we're working on a workflow that includes provisioning a VM. Yep. So, you know, the first question is, what service does this provisioning run under? Does it run under Orchestrator? Does it run under VMM? The second question, how do we go and actually make sure that we're still honoring the quotas which VMM has applied in its cloud? So if I try to provision more VMs than I have available in my cloud, um, will it notify us that this is happening? 
So a uh, couple of good questions. So first one, which service? Yes, so, so if I'm actually running an orchestrator run book yep. that goes and provisions a VM, yep. what's that provisioning process running under? Is it running under the context of the VMM server, or is it running under the context of orchestrator? Now, orchestrator is telling virtual machine manager to do something. So it's running as part of uh, virtual machine manager. It just happens it was orchestrator was the, the, the source of the call. Basically said, you go do this, and then however it handles it, it'll exactly. take that response. Orchestrator orchestrates. It, it orchestrates a series of activities and says, okay, I've got this run book I need to execute. I need to get this information from service manager. Now I need to go tell virtual machine manager, go build this. Right. Um, using, uh, go build this using this information. Here's my, uh, here's my security credentials, which is the run book service, or the orchestrator service, calling the virtual machine manager. Now you can add to that runbook checks and balances. Do you, does this user have the appropriate quota? Do they have um, the permissions to be able to do this? And I mean, the runbook that I created was a very simple one. Grab information, create virtual machine template. Mm -hmm. But you can add to that process the checks and balances to ensure that users are satisfying quota, um, are, are able to create runbooks. Um, all of those capabilities are part of the, the tool set. Excellent. So short answer, yes, yes. again, fully customizable. <laughs> He's an orchestrator. Yep. Um, so Cloud Services Process Pack allows us to actually uh, get going, get moving uh, faster uh, using out-of-the-box practices. Now, this also brings up one point that I've had a couple of questions on that I do want to touch on. That is, I mentioned the self-service portal, the VMM SSP. Um, the Cloud Services Process Pack is a replacement for the SSP. Um, and this is something I want to kind of be... Uh, be clear on how we how we approach this. The self-service portal was a solution accelerator that was built for um, the previous version of uh, release of Virtual Machine Manager. We're actually replacing that. Um, we will not have an SSP uh, version for Virtual Machine Manager 2012. What we have is the Service Manager Service Catalog, um, the Cloud Services Process Pack, and App Controller. Um, now, how we break that up is service, service Manager Service Catalog handles the process and provisioning um, components that was uh, VMM SSP, the self-service portal, in terms of uh, being able to request new capacity, request new, um, or register new business units, request cloud capacity, and create virtual machines. Um, App Controller allows us now to, uh, will allow us to actually operate those virtual machines, start them, stop them. Um, check to see how they're running, connect into them. So two components, ta we've taken the functionality that was part of SSP and we've actually expanded upon it in terms of what you can do um, using components that are now out of the box within the system center stack. Great. Well, while we're on the topic of, you know, the previous release, yep. um, I've had a question come in. What about old Opalis policies? How do we go and move an existing Opalis policy that I have into Orchestrator? Sure. The, um, it's a, Opalis and Orchestrator uh, is a, it's a migration <laughs> activity. So we take the Opalis uh, policies, they are, in, they're exported, there is some uh, steps you need to walk through to actually up, update those and then re-import them into Orchestrator. Um, it's a piece that uses our Orchestrator, uh, depending on the policy, you may need to use Orchestrator Integration Toolkit. Um, we may need to, uh, revise what those policies are, uh, depending on what are the steps that they've done. We've really rewritten some of the components in Orchestrator from Opalis to bring it, uh, to bring it up to date, to uh, update the code, make it more secure for, for customers to, to implement. And as a result, some of the pieces that were part of old Orchestrator policies uh, are not available anymore. Uh, so one of the things I do suggest to people is, yes, you can upgrade, you can migrate those policies into orchestrator runbooks, but it's also an option, opportunity to actually revisit how were those policies written uh, in the first place, and can we take advantage of some of the new features in orchestrator 2012 to improve upon those policies and translate them into runbooks. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you one more integration question. The, the, this one's a little harder. Uh, the question we have, how can we integrate uh, Service Manager with Project Server? Um, does this change anything with the project model extensions that we have in our cloud management pack? So Project Server, I don't know of any integrations that we have at this point in time. However, um, in terms of out of the box. However, 
we have standard activities. Remember, we have standard activities inside of Orchestrator um, of running PowerShell scripts, running .NET scripts, um, that if you can script something. You could say, call an API for can, project server. Absolutely. Uh, I do know of a partner that's created a project uh, add-on to Service Manager, um, but I've not gone down, gone into details in terms of how would we actually integrate that add-on for Service Manager into Microsoft Project, not Server, but Project, mm -hmm. um, and how it would link out to, to Orchestrator. But again, can you integrate it to? Can you integrate Service Manager to Project Server using Orchestrator? I would ask the question: Can you? create a script for project server uh, to call something in project server, because we could certainly call that PowerShell script or that .NET script using Orchestrator. Great. So again, with Orchestrator, <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> um, this is a simple workflow for a sample of the, the Cloud Services Process Pack workflow uh, that, is, that, that takes place uh, that allows us to configure and manage our fabric. So if, if we use my mouse here, I can see we configure and manage our fabric. Uh, we import our process pack uh, and configure our connector between service manager, operations manager, and orchestrator. Uh, the project administrator then requests a new project. In the SSP, this was registering a business unit. Um, that's then approved. We approve that project. The administrator then requests, OK, I have my new project. Now I want capacity in my project. Uh, once that capacity request is approved, now I start uh, requesting my virtual machines uh, that are running inside that capacity. So my capacity allows me to define how much quota I have, and then I can create my virtual machines inside that. And I can access those using App Controller to manage and manipulate my virtual machines. A um, couple of pieces that the process pack uh, allows us to do. Service catalog request offerings for creating and updating projects, capacity pools, and virtual machines, as well as decommissioning those. You create stuff, you got to be able to make sure that they're going to get decommissioned and you clean things up. Um, deploying services, uh, chargeback. There will be some sample chargeback capable or some basic chargeback and showback capabilities in terms of who's using what. In, that, that's coming with the, our ultimate release of System Center 2012. And then reporting about who's requesting what type of resources and what type of capacity. So we talked about going back to our uh, six steps or six process cycle. We imported, we built our offerings, we published those, we created them. I showed some of the out-of-the-box capabilities of how we're going to make it easier for users to create those, uh, the run books that get invoked. Um, I can go back. I'll, I'll hold off on the demo in terms of showing what the service catalog looked like because we actually already showed that. And we showed the automation capabilities as well, automation from a both a process and a system standpoint, but really from a systems perspective with Orchestrator. Um, again, we talked about that from an integration standpoint. We captured that runbook data from uh, Orchestrator into Service Manager. We captured the data that comes from uh, all the different line of business applications, or the, our line of business applications, as well as the other components of System Center. Uh, 2012, bring those into our CMDB so that we can then automate our fulfillment and I could, in this example, create those virtual machines. Um, we also want to be able to report and tell people about it uh, through uh, the Service Manager Data Warehouse, through either reports or dashboards. But I'm going to save that for, for our next session. Um, that connector framework allows us to get visibility of our configuration items, uh, as well as our automation uh, components. One thing to note that I just to draw that cl uh, clear line. Service Manager connectors allow us to pull data into the CMDB and get visibility of it. Orchestrator integration packs allow us to actually automate and execute activities from System Center to System Center or System Center outside of System Center. Um, we can use integration packs to pull data in uh, into from third-party applications into the CMDB, but within System Center, predominantly, we use the connector framework to do that. I talked about this at the beginning, but from a from a r orchestrator runbook perspective, there's a couple or automation perspective. There's a couple of concepts. We have activities, which are units of execution that perform a defined action. We talked about running a PowerShell script, um, running a .NET script, send an email, query a database, invoke a web service. 
uh, are all examples of some of the different types of activities. And there's, there's a couple hundred of a activities that, we've, that we provide by default. A runbook is, is really a collection of those activities uh, strung together to actually perform a, a task. Uh, we have this concept of a data bus inside of Orchestrator that allows us to, to pass uh, variables from activity to activity uh, and reference them and consume those, the, that information anywhere in our runbook. Um, and it allows us, it's a very unique thing to Orchestrator and very powerful activity because we don't have to continuously go back and look for information. If we used it once, we can reference it again elsewhere in our runbook. Uh, and then we have a series of standard activities that we ship out of the box that allows us to do uh, quite a number of different um, discrete activities that we can string, link together to perform a runbook activity. We have the runbook designer, which I uh, brought up and showed, allows us to group uh, activities together to form a runbook. It's a drag and drop authoring experience. Um, standard act, some of the standard activities I've already mentioned, but system commands, scheduled based activities, so we can schedule a runbook to run at a particular time. Um, manage, man, manage, manipulate files, notifications, manipulate text files, search and modify data, um, manage, kick off other workflows so, or r other runbooks. So you might have a runbook that actually mo monitors for a particular condition and then actually kick off. So you can actually link the run books. It's not that a run book is an independent object. It can be connected Absolutely. to other run books. Yep. Great. And actually invoke another run book to perform, uh, say, a remediation action. Great. Um, we have the integration toolkit that allows us to uh, build our own uh, if you want to. And then one thing to note is that the, the automation allows is, is open. We use the open data protocol, um, and we use a RESTful uh, interface. So we can actually make, expose this information externally uh, to make it easier for other, group, other integrations to be built. So I wanted to bring up, this is a snapshot of some of the integration packs we're bringing out uh, from a system center standpoint and Windows uh, standpoint for 2012. And that list uh, continues, or we continue to look at how we can add and grow that list. Uh, we also have a number of third party uh, management tools that are going to be provided either by Microsoft or by some of our partners uh, to support third-party light and business applications. What that allows us to do is, this is just is a simple scenario that we take a simple self-service request of creating that request, the necessary approvals, um, creating configuration items, assigning uh, it to, a, say, a virtual machine manager admin to fulfill, fulfilling that particular request, setting permissions, updating our CMDB, notifying the requester and closing it. Simple process for requesting a, a, a virtual machine. We, we walked through that sample. We can automate as much or as little of that as you wish. It really is up to the, it's up to the IT pro to determine how they want to, where they want to start. Do they want to automate just the process pieces in terms of the request and approvals? Do they want to automate the provisioning? Do they want to check for quotas? Do they want to um, set detailed permissions, assign specific storage. These are different options that the IT Pro has available to them uh, to drive greater consistency uh, of delivery and greater automation uh, for, their, for their organization, for their end users, for their customers. So we talked about aut monitoring uh, run books. Now, monitoring progress. How do we know when things are done? I showed an example of that in our service request where we have our, um, we can link out to the actual orchestrator runbook and see where, it's, where it is in progress. We can look at the particular uh, activities and see what progress they're in. Um, those are service manager and orchestrator. In the portal, you can actually connect to the portal and actually look at where your activity is and see the updates to that. Or we can set up email notifications. So a number of different ways that you can make, uh, monitor for progress and make sure that information is available or and the progress of a particular request is is available so we think from a private cloud standpoint it allows us to ensure that it's not just the infrastructure that gets built and delivered but it's the process and people side of it to ensure that you know what is happening um, it's delivered consistently uh, each time and every time so we walk through our our automated request offering in six steps importing runbook information and our CI data 
building those requests and standardizing what we're going to ask our end users, publishing those to our service catalog, allowing them to create that through the service catalog and the service request portal, um, invoking the necessary runbooks to actually fulfill that request, and then monitoring for its progress to ensure that where are we in the life cycle of that request? Is it ready? Is it, is it done? All of that encapsulates our, um, our approaches to service delivery and automation in terms of standardization, how we standardize the prompts, standardize the fulfillment, standardize the, the activities, the, the approvals and the, the execution of the appropriate runbooks. How we make it uh, give a self-service experience from a request perspective to the user to be able to choose what they want, when they want, to the level of service they want. And then the automation to back it up to ensure that, hey, if you get a thousand requests all at once, we can do it. Excellent. So that's... Well, that about sums it up. That about sums know. it all up. I, I think the big question that we're getting here is, mm -hmm. can I do something with something? And I think the answer is, yes, you can. <laughs> so we want to emphasize you know, th this theme, right? As long yeah. as you can script it, as long as it has APIs, as long as you can programmatically call something without needing manual user intervention, yep. you could use Orchestrator, create a custom runbook, script it. Whether it's a custom app, a third-party solution, or Microsoft technology, yes, you can. Yes, you can. And you can serve that up and make it possible for an end user to, to access that and create that request themselves. So again, you can make, make it possible for the IT pro to deliver that service um, and not have to continuously sit around waiting for that service or they can to, to waiting for someone to request it. They can focus on other things. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time, Sean. We're going to see you again later. Uh, we're going to Absolutely. talk about monitoring yep. using uh, the service delivery and automation layer. Um, and next, we're going to be joined by Adam Hall, who's going to be discussing application management with us, how we deploy that, uh, and then how we actually enable this end user to you know, really dive into the service catalog, make requests, monitor their apps, deploy them, and optimize them so they, they run perfectly in our private cloud environment. Yep. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks, we'll see Adam, you again for having soon. me. Take care.